Hi friends, I am taking the pile remote today because, well, here, let me show you. It's needle eating season. <coughs> yeah, let's go find some new growth tips. Yep, the needles of conifers like pines, spruces, and firs are all edible, but it's these bright neon green new growth tips that are the most palatable. Their flavor can be bright and lemony, but even those can also be super sour or bitter, so always taste test before harvesting. Then if you find one you like, harvest responsibly by not taking from saplings or too much from one tree. One thing to be aware of, a big exception to the edible needle rule is the yew tree. They're extremely poisonous, so definitely know how to identify and avoid them. These fleshy red berries are the easiest giveaway, but they may not always be on the tree, so always only harvest from trees you're 100% sure about. Okay, so after taste testing a few trees in the area, I really like the flavor of this white fir. So I'm going to gather some of its fresh tips to take home and try out a brand new recipe, a fir tip slushy. But you know I can't get off the mountain before finding some wood to bring home with me first. So we had a record winter in my home mountain range, uh, just tons and tons of snow. That led to, in this canyon I'm in right now, in particular, some pretty severe avalanches. I thought it'd be fun to bring you all with me on a little bit of adventure up this avalanche debris field. So we'll find something up here. Yeah, look at all these down trees. And since I have some really nice fir tips that I want to make into something, that's what I'm gonna hunt for piece of spruce or fir wood that I can pull out of this madness. Okay, look how cool that piece of aspen log is right there. Another one that came down. I can't quite reach it though, sadly. Look at this big old fella that just snapped. I always find it fascinating when a tree has broken and the rings are kind of individualized like this. I don't know, at least for me, I often get caught up in uh, just seeing grain and wood as this uniform pattern. And it's always interesting to see it laid out like this, where you really can see and get a sense for how each one of those is truly just the tree growing a new layer of itself year after year. It's neat. We got some service berries up here that are ripening and I see one boop, that is ready to eat. These are the best. Ooh, oh, that's so good. Every year I want to make a service berry video and every year the birds beat me to them. So I'm hoping this year I'll be able to treat you all with a good service berry episode. We are really in the thick of it now. Sorry, spider web. <sighs> okay, I see a clearing ahead. Ow. Oh yeah, avalanches are crazy, man. Okay, I think this is a more manageable size. I like that we've got a little bit of some crotch there and there. It is just a little too long, so I'm gonna cut it in half and we'll take the rest home. Let go, fibers! All right, what do you say we, uh... All right, let's take this thing home and use it to make some stuff that's gonna help us eat our frozen needle treat stuff. I, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what we're calling it, I don't know. Javel in the throw? <sighs> I'm basically to the bottom now, and this is an incredibly rotted out piece of Douglas fir. I mean, this thing weighs like an ounce. I think I'm gonna take it home and stabilize it, maybe? This thing's probably so full of bugs. Who's in here? There's one, one of them's home. What do you say, take that home as a teaser piece of content? Yeah, no reason not to try, right? 
Okay, here in another avalanche debris field, this one just off the side of the road. I've got a really nice candidate here. This one, I'm feeling really good about. Okay, um, this is definitely on the smaller side. I'm at a bit of a crossroads here because we have the larger half of the first piece of wood that I brought down. And then this, this one's gonna be plenty thick enough to make this little goblet that I have in mind. But this is such a cool piece of wood, I'd prefer to make this into a vase. So I'm gonna try to make this one work. This one, we're saving for another time. Onto the pile it goes. Oh, hey, bud. Look who decided to come visit. Come here, bud. Come here. Come say hi to the people. They want to see you. <sighs> what do you think, Miles? You think that's going to be big enough for us? That's a good boy. That's a good boy. That's my good boy. How you doing? Okay. So, yeah, I'm going to do my best. If it ends up being a little bit small, that's fine. I'll still be able to eat our frozen slushy dessert out of it. Let's, uh, let's have at it. This is too long though. I'm gonna go cut this in half on the bandsaw real quick and I'll be right back. Speaking of the slushy, this feels like the right time in the video to get started on that recipe. So while Garage Justin is busy cutting that limb down to size, let's head on inside and toss it over to Kitchen Justin. We've got our gorgeous fur tips here and I'm gonna use them to make a recipe that I learned about from a post by the always wonderful Chaotic Forager on TikTok and Instagram. So definitely check out their channel if you haven't. I, like the basic person I am, I'm calling it a slushy, but it's a variation on an Italian granita. So to a blender, I'm adding about two cups of fur tips, a cup of water, a half cup of sugar, the juice of two limes, and a pinch of salt. Then just blend as much as your blender can. This is where I wish I had a fancier blender than I do. Once that's all done, you're gonna to wanna to pour it into a baking sheet or a cake pan, something preferably made out of metal, but the biggest thing is that it can fit inside of your freezer because that's where it's gonna go for about 20 to 40 minutes. Pull it out when the sides are frozen and the center is still not frozen yet. Then grab a fork and just start, well, forking it. Scraping it down, mixing it up. And once you feel like you've got it pretty well forked at this stage, you're gonna wanna just put it back into the freezer for another 20 to 40 minutes. And then you're just gonna repeat the process. Give it a good forking again. And once you feel it's nice and forked, put it back in the freezer and repeat the process three or four times. You'll start to notice it getting lighter and fluffier each time. So while Kitchen Justin is busy with this freezing and forking process, let's return to Garage Justin to get digging into that piece of avalanche salvaged wood to make a granita goblet. This is gonna be the top, this is gonna be the bottom. So let's put this here. Okay, so first things first is to bring this piece of wood down to round. Gotta carve through all this bark and just see what we're working with underneath. It all looks deceptively large right now, by the way, so just brace yourself for a smaller goblet, which honestly I'm kind of into for this dessert. Okay, so the fur tips from our dessert came from the white fur, Abies concolor, and I'm pretty sure that's the tree that this wood is from as well. There is a chance that it's from the Douglas fir. The two trees share a lot of similarities, even though the Douglas fir isn't a true fir, and they both grow up on that mountainside. This came from a younger tree, and the young bark of both species is pretty similar. Their needles are also quite similar. They're both flat, friendly, and flexible, though the Douglas firs are much greener when mature. The easiest way to tell them apart, though, are their cones. The white fir grows these upright cones that disintegrate in the fall, while the Douglas fir grows these super super recognizable cones that look kind of like a spruce cone, but with these modified bracts on them that look like little mouse butts. Okay, so I've cut what's called a tenon into the bottom of the wood, which means I can turn it around and put it into this jaw-like piece called a chuck, which will hold the wood in place so that when I'm ready, I can carve the bowl into the top of the goblet.
right, I'll be honest, I've never really done a, a goblet of this type of shape before. I kind of prefer something a little more squat when I'm making my little ice cream dishes, but for something called a fur tip granita, it felt like it needed a, a more elegant form, if you will. Which means I'm just winging it right now. Basically bringing it down to a rough shape uh, before I grab some other tools to try to fine tune that. This is a pretty green piece of wood, meaning that there's still a lot of water inside of the fibers of the wood since it only came down in that avalanche just this past winter. After a tree falls or is cut down or dies, it stops pulling water out of the ground and eventually the wood fibers will completely dry out. But for a while, they still hold quite a bit of water and this actually really changes the properties of the wood when you're working with it. In a lot of ways, green wood is, is easier to turn and carve than dry wood, but there's upsides and downsides, really depends on the species as well. The other thing to keep in mind with working with Greenwood is it has the tendency to warp or crack. This trade-off is why most bowl turners will, will rough turn a bowl while it's still green and then let that dry out, warp and crack, and then finish turning after it's dried out. I'm not too worried about this one cracking, although it's probably gonna warp at least a little bit eventually down the road, but honestly I think that's just gonna make me like it even more. The biggest thing I'm noticing so far is that all those resin blisters on the outside of the wood, more on that in a minute, has gotten sap all over my hands. All right, so I'm covering out the inside of the bowl now, even though the base of the goblet is not done yet. And the reason for that is once that gets really thin, it makes the top part of this really unstable and would be much, much harder to carve out the inside of this bowl. The chances of snapping the thing off would increase exponentially. But I did want to get a rough shape down first before, before carving out the bowl. Now with the bowl all done, it's all about just getting that stem as thin as I comfortably can. about as good as it's going to be. I definitely worry that if I try to fiddle with it too much more, I'm going to break something. So let's sand, add an oil finish, part it off, and probably make a tiny little spoon as well, don't I? Let's get after it. Yeah, I'm kind of happy with how this turned out. Uh, for what a small piece of wood we had to go with, this is about as good a bowl at the top as I could hope for. 
The base, I did leave too large. I kind of suspected that I was leaving it a bit too large and I should have listened to my instinct because as soon as I parted it off, it really makes the top feel even smaller. I think if I had a, a smaller base here, this wouldn't feel quite so small. But hey, we live and we learn, and this is gonna hold my slushed treat. Before we turn it over to kitchen, Justin, I just know I'm gonna hear it from all of you if I don't make a little fir wood spoon to eat my slushy with. So I've grabbed the other half of the log that we made the goblet from. Oh yeah, here's an example of some of those resin blisters I was talking about. One thing I'll say about all this stuff in there is it smells so, so good. Anyway, just gonna cut a small little slab here. Trace a little spoon outline. Rough cut it out on the bandsaw. And then get to carving. Now, the sound of a hook knife cutting into green wood is just one of the truly most wonderful things to sit and listen to. And lucky for you and me, I live on what has to be one of the loudest streets in North America. I swear, every single person on the planet was either doing yard work or flooring their car directly in front of my house the entire time I was using it. But hey, the yard work did let up by the time I got to using the regular knife. The wood of the white fir tree, like other fir trees, is really soft and fairly brittle, which means it's not very often used in woodworking. It's typically used for making paper and wood pulp. And it also means that hand carving something like this tiny little spoon is a bit of a mixed bag. A lot of the cuts, as you might imagine, are much, much easier to make than it would be with a really hard species of wood, but others, especially in things like the bowl of the spoon, you're far more likely to get what's called tear out, where these weak fibers, as you make the cut, get torn out instead of cleanly cut. And before I wrap up, since this episode is all about the white fur, let's close with some fun facts about this really cool tree. That pitch and resin that we saw earlier has a lot of traditional medicinal uses. It's naturally antimicrobial and can be applied topically as a poultice to treat wounds, sores, and skin infections. The pliable fibrous inner bark of the tree is used in basket weaving and to create cordage and ropes. It's a wildly popular urban landscaping tree thanks to its pleasant aroma, its attractive shape, and ability to thrive in a variety of conditions. And of course, last but not least, as we've already talked plenty about, its needles are edible and a crucial traditional source of vitamin C, as even in the dark of winter, all you need is a handful of those needles and some hot water to make a delicious and healthy cup of tea. All right, now let's just add an oil finish to our tiny little spoon while even more people decide to do yard work. Okay, and with that, we're all done with our white fur goblet and spoon. Taking a closer look at the goblet, and even though I, I still think the, the base is too large, I am really happy with how this turned out. The wood especially looks so, so cool. Some awesome grain pattern on the side and especially down in the bowl. And even this tiny little spoon, I really like how it turned out as well. We have that cool darker grain right there on the side and some kind of fun color variation in there. Let's turn it over to Kitchen Justin to pull the tray out of the freezer and give that fur tip granita one final forking before we scoop it all up and into our brand new goblet. Add the spoon and... All right, let's give it a taste. Ooh, I overpacked the bowl a little bit. What I will say about this recipe is good mild fir or spruce tips are absolutely crucial because unlike say the spruce tip ice cream where you filter it all out and you're just left with a cream base that's flavored with the spruce tips or fir tips, with these you're eating the actual tips themselves. So definitely taste them first, make sure they're not really bitter or overly tannic. I do think the ice cream version is a lot more approachable. Uh, so if you're a bit nervous or looking to try to do this for the first time, or especially if you're looking to introduce friends and family into something wild like trying a tree flavored dessert. I would probably recommend that first. So I guess I'm gonna have to make that recipe for you here pretty soon, aren't I? Anyway, it's very, very, very refreshing. See you next time.